Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Bishop of the Western American Diocese of the Serbian Orthodox Church, Bishop Maxine, if you haven't seen this, this is a petition, the Serbian Orthodox Patriarchate, about the glorification of Archbishop Mardarie and Archimandrite Sebastian Dabovic. The names you need to get to know. Archbishop Mardarie, I can't tell you a whole lot about. He was the first Serbian bishop in this country to unite the Serbian church here and minister to that flock for many years. Archimandrite Sebastian, I'm far more familiar with. <coughs> Archimandrite Sebastian was the first man ordained who was born on American soil in San Francisco in 1863. His parents came from Serbia, but he was an American. And Archimandrite Sebastian was the first monastic tantrum on American soil. Remember, this Russia is still over Alaska at this point, so the first American born is Archimandrite Sebastian. <coughs> Archimandrite Sebastian spent his life going back and forth across this country, ministering to the faithful, whether they were Serbians or Arabs or Greeks or Americans or whatever they may be, Russians, whatever language they spoke. He spoke English as well, remember this. He also went to Serbia quite often to minister to the people of his you know, own family, his own heritage. Archimandrite Sebastian lived in great poverty. He was quite well spoken and written. He wrote many sermons that you can buy in English. They would be very pertinent even today. One time, St. Nikolai Velimirovich asked him how he expected to do these missionary journeys he had planned to Alaska and to Russia and to Japan when he had just spent his last five cents on a roll so he could do something. He said, God will provide. St. Nikolai marveled at his poverty. When he went across the country and realized that the Orthodox faithful were being tempted by the society and beginning to believe that all religions were equal and things like this just being kind of watered down, he called it foul treachery. He was no man of weakness. Archimander Sebastian, in his repose, was called a viceless man by St. Nikolai. And it's said that he baptized, perhaps certainly at the time, more people than any man in the history of American Orthodoxy. Died in 1940, so he's not that far removed from us. <coughs> at his deathbed, he could go on for many hours about Father Sebastian, really, but on his deathbed, one of the monks worrying about his demise at this point asked him, did he have any wish? Father, is there anything you wish right now? Because you could see he was suffering. And Father Sebastian simply said to him, only the kingdom of heaven. And that is really what this day is about. The feast of all saints, and these people who gave the ultimate sacrifice, their very lives, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, for Christ, lived their lives in such a way that their wish was only the kingdom of heaven. Father Sebastian, Metropolitan Joan and I used to talk about him, Hopefully he'll be glorified by the OCA. Hopefully the OCA is going to accept that glorification soon and put him in to our ranks as well. His relics, by the way, were transferred a few years ago back from Serbia. He died in Serbia, back to Jackson, California. So he is here. Taylor and I visited his former grave in Zicha, where St. Nikolai was from in Serbia. An amazing man, but not that unlike us. Born in America with many of the same temptations, many of the same struggles, <clears throat> the same broken up orthodoxy into jurisdictions, but he didn't use that as an excuse. Only the kingdom of heaven is what he wanted. And the martyrs used no excuse. They gave the ultimate sacrifice because neither father or mother or daughters or sons or wives or children or lands separated from the love of God. Christ is worth giving that sacrifice for. And we celebrated this gift, of course, of the Holy Spirit last week and see how these martyrs were able to endure the great sufferings they underwent and how the great ascetics were able to endure the things they underwent and the evangelists and all the great saints of the church and the pious husbands and wives because of that presence of the Holy Spirit. The God who is above all things, the God who is uncreated while we are created, which already is the ultimate difference. The God who is, we call beyond all being, but is even far beyond that. The God that is inexpressible yet intimately with us. The God that is love, 
It really is not because our word cannot confine him to that love. He's far beyond that. The God that is over all creation but is beyond all creation. The God that we call a consuming fire, but fire cannot contain what is God. But yet we tend to talk about him rather tritely sometimes and vainly. We should cross ourselves in fear to speak of theology, in fear and awe when we speak of the name of God alone in our prayers. That is our approach to prayer. We learn from the church in its prayers in church. The scriptures came about because of the rule of faith. They matched up with what the church was already praying for the first 300 years of the church. We learn our relationship with God. It is important to have knowledge of God through prayer and through the worship of the church. To come to church. The idea of Sunday worship is not an orthodox notion by any stretch of the imagination. Orthodoxy is life, as it was for Father Sebastian, as it was for Archbishop Mardarier, or as it was for all the martyrs, as it was, of course, for St. Anthony the Great. You may remember the story of one time when he was decided to live in the desert, in the tombs, and the demons were tormenting him and beating him, physically beating him. Imagine this. The only thing that kept him alive was the grace of God. And eventually, some of his acquaintances found him in his cave, passed out, lying as a dead, wounded. And they take him back so he can heal. The first thing he does after his prayer is he gets up and walks back to this place where the people are telling him, don't go back there, look what they've already done to you. And he says he will not leave what he has begun. Anthony goes there, the demons are quite horrified that he has come back, and they say, challenge him for his coming back, and he says, here I am, demons. Imagine the audacity to do that, the strength, the courage to do that. <coughs> Anthony will never leave his post. No matter what you do to me, the grace of God is stronger. So they began to appear, appear to him in various forms, as beasts, as lions, as bears, as snakes, scorpions. He mocks them for having to appear as vermin to try to scare him off. And defeats them with the sign of the cross, telling them they have no power over him whatsoever. It is not allowed. They flee because of his strength, because of his faith, and ultimately because of his humility. And as the demons flee, he sees the cell open up above him and light pour in in the presence of Christ. And he says, where were you, my Lord? He says, Anthony, I was always here. I was waiting to see you prevail. From now on, I will never leave your side. The struggle is worth it. The God who is that consuming fire that I was mentioned is also the God that deigned to come amongst us and become as one of us while still being the uncreated God who is before the ages, before there was a time. We should think in awe of this. That he loved us that much. That he gave his life for us. That it is more than worth giving our life for him to experience him now. Not just that we might not go to hell and might be saved. Some simple notion of that. Far beyond that, we might experience the presence and the fullness of God now, today. Not tomorrow, not 50 years from now, not at our death, not at the second coming. Those are good too, great too, but now. Because if you don't know him now, as I said last week, you won't know him then. We must meet Christ in this life. And the way to do that is to give our lives, as he says over and over and over and over in his holy scriptures and through the presence of the saints. There is no example of a saint, you're not going to find one, that did not that didn't deny himself and take up his cross and follow. The cross being an instrument of death, as we know. Gave up whatever they had to give up. Wives, children, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, lands, children, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, if it was necessary. If that got in the way of God, that had to go too. If it helped them toward God, that was great. But nothing could separate them from the love of Christ Jesus, as Anthony told those demons as well. 
And even though a host should be arrayed against him, as the Psalter says, his heart would not be afraid. <coughs> Because Christ was with him. The presence of the Holy Spirit was with him. And our wish each day and each thing that we do should be only the kingdom of heaven. To quote Saint Sebastian. I had the privilege this past week of erasing him from my diptychs of the departed. As I had done previously in the past two years with Elder Porfirios and Elder Paisios. And I'm sure there will be others. But it's nice now that I'm not praying for them. They're praying for me, even though I knew they were beforehand and prayed through them. They are examples for us of how to live this life. And you look at the examples of all those lives, and especially the martyrs who we celebrate today, they gave everything. Every moment was about one thing, only the kingdom of heaven from this day, from this hour, from this minute, as St. Herman tells us, that to serve God above all else and to seek to fulfill his only will. St. Sebastian and Mandari, pray to God for us. Amen. <laughs>